Welcome to Language in Film, where we take a closer look at how language is used creatively in cinema. The Mortal Remains is the final chapter in the 2018 Coen Brothers Western anthology entitled The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. This act features five characters riding in a stagecoach together on their way to a place called Fort Morgan. However, this is actually a pun, and instead they're going to Fort Morg Inn, because halfway through the conversation, we realize that this is a coach ride to the afterlife. It's the American Western equivalent of crossing the River Styx. In Greek mythology, the River Styx was the boundary between Earth and the underworld. After you died, your soul had to pay the boatman Charon in order to be ferried across the water to Hades. Most world mythologies have a version of this passage or journey that your soul must take once you die and pass from this world to the next. It makes sense, therefore, that in the mythology of the Western, it would be a stagecoach. Charon is the coachman. He never speaks. We never see his face. And we're told repeatedly he will not stop or slow down. He will not stop. He never stops. Look, policy. On one side of the coach sit three people, a trapper, a lady, and a Frenchman named René. These are the three souls that are being ferried across to the land of the dead. Just like the audience, the souls begin this chapter not realizing they're traveling to the underworld. On the opposite side of the coach sit two gentlemen, an Englishman named Thigpen and an Irishman named Clarence. They are sometimes referred to as bounty hunters, but I'll call them the duo because they're not actually bounty hunters. They're exterminating angels. Collectively, they are the personification of death, the Grim Reaper. How do we know this? Well, for one, they directly tell us. I like to say that we're reapers, harvesters of souls. We help people who have been adjudged to be right. In other words, people whose time is up. A bounty hunter wouldn't use such fatalistic terminology. But the trapper interrupts him and assumes they are bounty hunters. You're bounty hunters. Literal man. Cruel man. In other words, we're not literally bounty hunters, but if you want to call us that, fine, whatever. These two gentlemen appear unfettered with guilt or any earthly concerns. They're jovial and dapper. There's no real difference between the two characters, except in one respect we'll get to later. There's no real conversation between these two, in the same way that the three souls argue among themselves and differ in perspective. The duo are in complete agreement with one another, and only serve to complement and reinforce what the other says. Lastly, it's clear they've taken this ride many times and know exactly where they're headed, unlike those who sit across from them. You haven't been to Fort Morgan before, I take it? Me? No. You? Oh yes, many times, many times. Ferrying cargo. If they were human souls, how would it be possible for them to make this journey to the afterlife multiple times? The conversation which occurs in the stagecoach is divided into two parts. The first part involves the three human souls arguing among themselves over the nature of humanity. The duo speak little here, except to politely encourage the souls to continue talking while exchanging knowing glances between each other. The second part of the conversation becomes an exchange between humanity and death. The three souls stop arguing and now collectively ask death questions about the nature of death. And there's a very clear boundary which separates these two sections of the conversation. That boundary is the moment when the lady gets so worked up from the argument that she has a little panic attack. This halts the arguing between the three souls and they now start trying to help each other. The trapper starts fanning her, and the Frenchman tries to get the coachman to stop. But the coachman never stops. It's at this point the souls and the audience begin to realize this isn't a normal coach ride. This is also when Clarence sings a lovely, haunting version of what most people would recognize as the streets of Laredo. So the panic attack, the futile attempt to slow the coachman, and the song serve to divide the conversation into its two parts. The two sections are distinct in tone as well. The first is comedic, the second is sinister. Finally, the two sections are lit very differently. The first occurs as the sun is setting with bright golden light illuminating everything. The second occurs after the sun has set and everything is awash in blue and shadow. 
This means the sun must have dipped below the horizon during the boundary point, which separates the two sections, which I interpret as the moment of death for the souls. When I first watched this section, I assumed they were dead the whole time. Actually, I assumed they were alive until I realized they were dead halfway through. But after studying this section a little closer, it now seems that the souls are alive for the first part of the conversation and dead for the second part. In that way, their journey parallels the course of the sun as it sets, which is, of course, a symbol for death. The first section of conversation opens with Thigpin singing gaily, causing the trapper to awaken from dozing. Thigpin apologizes for waking him, but the trapper insists, You did not wake me, for I was not asleep. Oh, not asleep. I see. The trapper is mistaken, though. He was clearly asleep. I think this is a spiritual metaphor, a comment on the way many people go through life asleep without realizing it. The conversation then begins with a comical monologue from the trapper about his life. He's lived alone in the woods mostly, occasionally descending into town. He had a relationship with a Native American woman, but they could not speak each other's language. Yet the trapper claims they could often understand each other through facial expressions and vocal inflection. This lines up with the topic of the video I did on pragmatic language in the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. So be sure to check out that video if you haven't, where I discuss nonverbal and pragmatic language. That video looked at just how much we actually rely on nonverbal cues and intonation to communicate. Well, according to the trapper, that's all you really need. He goes on to say that often they would just talk to each other because the act of doing so satisfied his need to connect socially. And it may be a broader analogy for human relationships. After all, many times we talk at our partner, thinking that we're conveying what we want to say, but our listener can interpret our words in ways that we don't expect. When his monologue is finished, Clarence asks the trapper if he loved the woman, which prompts the trapper to then state his view on the nature of humanity. The fact that he could understand her nonverbal communication leads him to conclude that people are like ferrets or a beaver, all pretty much alike. Yeah, one like the next. I don't doubt it's the same even if you travel to Siam. Now, whether you agree with the trapper's philosophy or not, the dour lady sitting next to him certainly doesn't, and she then refutes his position and states her own. People are not the same. There are two kinds, utterly distinct. And what would those be, madam? What follows is illuminating because the characters take turns guessing what two kinds of people she means. And each person guesses differently based on what they believe is the most important distinction to draw in life. For the Frenchman, it's lucky or unlucky. Clarence guesses healthy or frail. This is a little joke because later we find out his job is to sneak up on and strike people that the duo kill while Thigpin distracts them. So of course for Clarence, the only distinction that really matters is if the person is going to be easy to kill or hard to kill. Later, Thigpin will clarify the duo's perspective. In our business, they are dead or alive. So you will take them alive? I didn't say that. That's the only important distinction, really, for the Grim Reaper. The Trapper says, One kind. Ain't no two kinds. Unless you mean Trapper and Townsman. So his only dichotomy is him and everybody else. And then the lady gives her meaning. Upright and sinning. What's important here is that everyone has a different idea, a different perspective. Nobody's objectively right or wrong. It's all relative to their point of view. However, none of the souls understand this. To them, their view is the right one, and everyone else's view is wrong, and they're unable to see or take a different perspective. The Trapper, for instance, doesn't understand why people find him tedious, even though it's obviously due to his long-winded nature. He doesn't understand why his female companion left him, even though he claims they could adequately understand one another despite not speaking the same language. You know, she was often vexed with me. I seldom knew why. And then she moved on. The lady doesn't believe she was a burden to her children, but the Frenchman challenges this. And can you imagine if she was your mother-in-law and came to live with you for three years? She also assumes her husband feels the same way towards her that she does towards him, something which the Frenchman again challenges. And for the Frenchman, René, his core philosophy is that we are each unique and cannot truly know one another. 
We each have a life, each a life, only our own. So we must each spin our own wheel and play our own end. His statement about how love can have different meanings, an idea rejected by both the trapper and the lady, is another way of saying that our unique perspectives are unknowable to one another. It's like the trapper's story of himself and his partner talking to each other in different languages, incomprehensible to one another. Hence the story about being unable to play his friend's poker hand. Our man wager, it is decided by who he is, by the entirety of his relation to poker, right up until the moment of that bet. I cannot bet for you. Pourquoi pas? I cannot know you. Not to this degree. Which, by the way, has an interesting link to chapter one of this movie, and we'll talk about that later. For the Coen brothers, in this film and others, gambling is often a symbol for making any choice in life. No matter what decision we make about anything, it's always a gamble because we aren't assured of the outcome. We can't see the future and therefore the consequences of our actions. Yet, as Rene states, we must still each play our own hand, make our own choices. Call it. If we go with the assertion I made earlier about sundown representing the moment of death, then in this first section, the three souls spend their dying final moments bickering with one another in a futile attempt to argue the validity of their own worldview while simultaneously ignoring the arguments of the others. Then, boom, they're dead, having failed to convince each other of anything. Yet I think it's important that they do come together at the moment of death during the panic attack. It's not that they don't empathize or have compassion for their fellow human beings, it's just that it takes a catastrophe to make this happen. The second section begins with a song, just as the first section did, only this time it's the other member of the duo who is singing, The Streets of Laredo. This is an old American folk song about a cowboy who is lamenting the life choices that have led him to his death and also giving instructions for his funeral. It's a classic Western ballad that fits squarely in with the themes of the whole movie. Clarence doesn't actually sing The Streets of Laredo, though, but an earlier version of the folk ballad called The Unfortunate Rake. In this version, a man is dying from syphilis he's contracted from a woman of ill repute, and again, he's lamenting his life choices and the fact that if he had known about the disease sooner, he might have had time to get medicine for it, or pills of white mercury. But now, it's too late. So the story is slightly different, but very much the same theme as The Streets of Laredo. Had I known I would die, I would have made different choices. The song moves Thigpen to tears, who apologizes, saying, he sings it every trip. The fact that Clarence sings this very early version of this song is yet another indication that he and Thigpen have probably been at this job for longer than one might expect. The souls now start to realize they're dead and headed towards the afterlife, with death sitting across from them. They cease arguing. The duo now do most of the talking, elaborating on their profession and answering questions from the souls. As mentioned earlier, the two men don't really espouse different views or attitudes from one another. They're essentially the same character. The only real difference between the two men is the role they play in taking a life. They do it the same way every time. They're so easily taken when they're distracted, people are. So, I'm the distractor, and Clarence does the thumping while that attention is on me. He's very good, this one. You should see him. No, he's good. I can't thump. It's this key distinction that distinguishes the two men and must be important to the Coens, or they would have written death simply as a single character. The focus here is on the unexpected nature of death, that it sneaks up on you from behind. It can happen in an instant with no warning, and often does to characters in Coen Brother movies. But if we all know that we're mortal, then why don't we see it coming? Why does death so often take us by surprise? Well, for the Coen brothers, who can be a bit cynical, it's because we spend our time being distracted by stories. Thigpen says, You know the story, but people can't get enough of them, like little children. So long as the people in the stories are us, but not us. Not us in the end, especially. The midnight caller gets him, never me.
Storytelling is how we process what it means to be human and to live and die. We've most likely been telling stories since language began, at least 50 to 100,000 years ago. Stories allow us to remove ourselves to a safe distance where we can identify with the characters but not have to suffer what they're suffering. And we can safely process that suffering. The message of the Coen brothers is, look, you'll have to face death just like these characters. And if you don't stop to realize that and come to terms with it and figure out how to live your life and strive for what really matters for you, then you're in danger of wasting your whole life distracted by pursuit of things that won't save you in the end. And death will take you by surprise from behind. The conversation ends with Thigpen saying he enjoys looking into the eyes of his victims as they negotiate the passage and try to make sense of it. And of course, he's looking squarely into the eyes of each of the three souls as he's saying this. I do. Try to make sense of what? All of it. And do they succeed? Asked the lady. To which Thigpen responds, how would I know? I'm only watching. Even death doesn't really understand how it all works. The duo are as much in the dark about the grand scheme of things as the souls they harvest. And lastly, notice that when they arrive at their destination, Thigpen mentions that it's too late to drop off their cargo, Mr. Thorpe, with the sheriff. This must be a reference to God, who in the mythology of the American Western would be a sheriff, right? The one responsible for trying to maintain law and order. The fact that the souls in the coach don't realize they're dead links their journey thematically to the journeys of the other characters in the other stories, all of whom are in a sense already dead. They're trapped in their own fate. They're mortal and will inevitably die, even if they don't do so on screen. Although most of them do die at the end of their story on screen. In only one of the other stories does the main character survive the events of the plot, and it's a pretty big shock when he does. Why did the gold miner survive being shot in the back while the other characters in the other stories weren't nearly as fortunate? Was he just lucky and the bullet didn't hit a vital organ? Is he saved by God's grace because he's an honest, hardworking man who perseveres? Or does it even matter who gets the gold? The person who digs for it or the person clever enough to patiently wait and then make his move? Each of the souls on the stagecoach would interpret this story very differently. And that's the point. Any of these worldviews could be valid, but we can't ever truly know the answer, or even if there is an answer. Yet we have to live and make our decisions in life couched in this mortal ignorance. There are also several parallels between this final chapter of the movie and the first. The first act is not a story so much as an introduction to the themes of the movie. Both the last and the first chapters open with singing. Both are basically conversations. Buster Scruggs winds up in a town called Frenchman's Gulch and Rene is a Frenchman. More importantly, Rene's philosophy that you can't play another man's hand has a parallel to the first act, which I completely missed the first couple times I watched this movie. In act one, Buster arrives in town and enters the saloon, of course, because that's what gunslingers do in westerns. They arrive in town and go to the saloon and, of course, wind up in a gunfight. So when Buster walks in, there's a group of men at a table playing poker, and one of them folds and leaves. Buster takes his seat at the table and glances at the man's hand. He is then told he must play the man's hand after looking at it. Buster doesn't want to play the hand, but he's told that he has to, and the reason is he's already looked at the cards. The hand, aces and eights, is known infamously as dead man's hand. It's supposedly the hand played by Wild Bill Hickok that got him murdered. That's the story anyway. So that's why Buster Scruggs probably doesn't want to play it. But he's told he has to. Everyone in the table is in agreement that since he looked at the cards, he has to play the hand. Now, when you consider what we said earlier about gambling and poker hands representing any choice in life and our fate in general, the hand that we're dealt, it makes sense why everyone insists he must play the hand. It would go against the natural order of things if we could see our hands and choose not to play them, right? But that's not how it works. And Buster thinks he can get out of this scrape, and at first it seems like he does. But in the end of the chapter, death still comes for him. 
I should have seen this coming. Just as inevitably as it comes to the other characters in the other stories, and just as it will inevitably come for us as well. Okay, on that happy note, I'll end this video. Thanks for watching, guys. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's a few stories I need to go distract myself with. Coen Brother movies are definitely on my list of great movies that use dialogue and language creatively, particularly in the way they employ regional dialects. So if you had to pick just one of their films for me to analyze, which one do you think I should make a video on next? Let me know in the comments. Call it.